So I want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Emilio Dottori. I'm the executive director of the Milwaukee Turners. Um, we are, the Milwaukee Turners are extremely excited to present the second episode of the Bell Phillips Forum. Uh, I know we, we gushed last week, but we're very grateful that her son Michael gave us his permission and his blessing for this endeavor. Uh, we're incredibly proud to name the program after Bell. She was a guest here many, many times, and a lot of Turners are proud to have been friends with her. You're joining us for the very uh, for the second episode of the Vell Phillips Forum, this one focusing on arts and culture. Uh, and we'll be exploring two new books uh, written by Milwaukee Turners, one on Black liberation, the other on romantic friendship. Uh, we'll be broadcasting this program three times a month. Two episodes will be on important issues du jour, and the third episode uh, will focus more on arts and culture and how this overlays with these issues. Uh, today's format will be a little different uh, from how it usually will be, our guests, both of whom are Milwaukee Turners and professors at Marquette University, will actually discuss and interview one another about their two recent books. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Chrissy Fung, our co-producer, will help moderate the questions. Uh, she also uh, edits and puts this up on YouTube. I want to thank uh, our many co-sponsors, uh, Marquette University Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach, uh, MICA, which is Milwaukee's Inner City Congregations Allied for Hope, the Milwaukee Jewish Community Relations Council, the National Lawyers Guild of Milwaukee, Rid Racism Milwaukee, Tosa Together, and Wisconsin Voices. Our two guests today, both of whom are my friends, are uh, Robert Smith. Uh, Dr. Robert Smith is the Harry G. Johnson Professor of History and the Director of the Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach at Marquette University. His research and teaching interests explore the intersections of race and law, Dr. Smith is the author of Race, Labor, and Civil Rights, Griggs versus Duke, Power, and the Struggle for Equal Employment Opportunity. He's also the author of Black Liberation from Reconstruction to Black Lives Matter. Uh, prior to joining Marquette University, Dr. Smith served as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Inclusion and Engagement and the Director of Cultures and Communities Program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He also volunteers as the resident historian for America's Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee. And Rob is the proud father of Henderson Marcellus Smith. Uh, and we'll be sharing links uh, where you can purchase Dr. Smith's book in the chat in a moment. Uh, joining Dr. Smith is my friend, Dr. Alison Clark Efford, who is originally from New Zealand, as you will hear momentarily. She's an associate professor at Marquette University and an historian of immigration in 19th century United States, especially focusing on questions of race and power, which stand at the center of her work, which typically intertwines cultural, social, and political analyses. Her first book, German Immigrants, Race and Citizenship in the Civil War Era, explored how German Americans contributed to the rise and fall of the white commitment to black rights. Uh, Dr. Efford and Dr. Victoria Billich's Radical Relationships, the Civil War Era Correspondence of Matilda uh, Francisca Annika, covers a German Milwaukee and feminist life between 1859 and 1865, especially her intense uh, cohabitating relationship with another woman. Um, and she'll be discussing that book uh, with Dr. Smith today. Uh, and when not serving on the Milwaukee Turner's board, she enjoys biking, hiking with her son, uh, with her husband and her wonderful son, Lincoln. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our a distinguished guest to begin this important conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Rob and Allison. We look forward to this. We'll come in again at the end. We're happy to curate questions from the panelists and we'll share them with our, uh, with our guests. Thanks, Emilio. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. We are <clears throat> in another Zoom conversation. You know, if you've been in any Zoom conversations with me, I like to play in the chat. So I'll be having all kinds of fun in the chat with you. Good, Dr. Effort. How are you today? I am well, Dr. Smith. Um, <laughs> um, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I thought it was interesting. We had a quick phone call kind of to think about, oh, how are we going to do this? And we kind of jumped into to the the, the challenging sort of issues and the significance for today and the process right. of writing the book. Uh, and then at one point, I think we said, well, probably we should start by just, you know, giving the elevator pitch, right? <laughs> like telling people what they need to know, like about our books to get to get everyone on on the same page. So Absolutely. like the elevator pitch, like the, the version of your book that you could tell someone in the time it takes to, to write an elevator. So why don't I start by, look, I, I copy, hold up a copy of your book. Um, so Black Liberation from Reconstruction to Black Lives Matter. Um, 
<laughs> tell um tell us tell us yeah. well, tell us about your book well let, let, before we start let me also shout out dr sandra jones's new book um voices of milwaukee bronzeville that will be <clears throat> shared with us and attendees throughout the talk and then also subsequently so i want to make sure to shout that out i can't wait to use that in class you know this this book is really um a, a, a part of the important conversation we're having as educators more broadly. And it's, you know, how do you not only tell stories accurately, move voices from the margins and the peripheries to the center, but then also how do you engage students in that process? And so what the book really is, it's a, it's a debate-driven textbook. And the fundamental question that we're debating is, was there a breakthrough in civil rights in the 1960s? And if so, what does the documentary evidence suggest either if indeed there was a, a, a breakthrough or if there was not? And it gives students and educators the opportunity to explore those, that question and that debate using some of the key documents we've used throughout examining uh, US history since Reconstruction. Uh, but then we also folded in some, some new uh, documents that we don't typically get to uh, explore in the classroom. Because sometimes it's, it's, it's both a question of whether they're available immediately and, and if they're controversial in some ways. And so that was the longest elevator ride ever. <laughs> you know, uh, so now it's your turn. Was, was, give us your elevator pitch, because I tried to show people this book here on Zoom, but it's blocked out. It's blurred because you <laughs> because got some of all Scandalous, but yeah, you got a PG seventeen yeah. NC <laughs> something or other. Yeah, <laughs> um, tell us about it. Yeah, you know this is going to be challenging because I want to follow up on all those little things, those points that you raised in your um, talk, introducing your book. But we have time for that. So this is also it's an edited collection, um, and it's a collaboration. Um, I have to my very important shout out is to my collaborator, Dr. Victoria Bilic um, at UW Milwaukee, who is in translation and interpreting studies. Um, a great program over there at UWM, um, and we work together. Um, to edit and contextualize and translate, her doing the, the heavy translation lifting, um, the letters of Matilda Francisca Arnica. Um, and if we were all in person, I would kind of ask for a show of hands. I think uh, who, who recognizes this name, this Matilda Arnica woman? Um, some people around Milwaukee do know her. She was a German-American um, feminist, um, sort of a leading proponent of women's suffrage around the Civil War era in Milwaukee. So she hobnobbed with names you would recognize, like Susan B. Anthony and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, but she also had a very dramatic kind of personal life. There's a lot else going on, and the letters really cover um, 1859 to 1865, which coincides with the U.S. Civil War, right? So this is Civil War, it coincides quite nicely with the U.S. Civil War. It also coincides with um, Matilda Annika's really intense cohabiting romantic friendship with Mary Booth, who is a Yankee, um, so Anglo-American um, abolitionist. Um, so, yes, I'm not, yes, are we there yet? Have we stopped? Is the door opening? I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, it, well, we'll get back to them because the letters are really uh, remarkable in so many ways. And there are some interesting connections that, that you and I certainly will make as we, as we talk more about the books. But what, what attracted you to this project? And then I'll answer the same question. But how did you, how did you get to, to this, these characters, these historical uh, figures? And then also the themes of the book. Yeah, I mean, maybe the quick answer is I was attracted to it because I didn't realize it would take so long. It was going to be just a little side project uh, because I got to know Matilda Annika and I called her Matilda. I mean, it's a controversial choice. I respect her a lot. And I, I so I would call her um um, if I met her, I wouldn't I'd necessarily start by calling her Matilda. But when you read someone's intimate letter, so um, a rape, 
there's also a trial um, where uh, Mary Booth's very famous husband is tried for, quote, unquote, seducing a 14-year-old. Um, so that's just, just very sort of like I'd never expected to find that sort of evidence. Um, but the reason why it hasn't been more broadly used is that it's in German. She never really liked speaking English, um, even though she lived in Milwaukee for, for 30 years. Um, so there are these amazing sources. And Victoria and I were looking for a project to work on together. Um, and we were just... We just sort of people need to know about this woman. She's fascinating. These sources are fascinating, um, but it's it's slow going um, and and sort of slower than we expected. Transcribing the old German handwriting and then and translating them um, into into English. Yeah, and I, I yeah, I would like to throw the question right back at you, Rob, because and you and I were talking about this a little bit. These aren't the sort of high status projects for mm -hmm. academics right. um and this is a little bit of sort of inside baseball right but among professors we were the 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 highest prestige goes to what we call the monograph right like right. the um right. argued um the argument the mm -hmm. sort of book length arguing um both edited collections so why why did you take you on know, this the, project there's a couple of reasons one of which is the the, the fundamental question of uh, progress in regards to racial equality is, is forever going to be a conversation that we have to interrogate. Uh, that doesn't appear to be going away anytime soon in this country and, and globe. Uh, but one of the things we have to make sure that we do is, is provide young people in particular and educators especially with the tools to effectively engage the debate and to also not run away from the debate. And so the book sits in a series where multiple important historical moments, eras, threads <clears throat> are being debated. And we're just making sure that we have some source material to effectively engage the discussion. We understand fully these days how truth itself is under fundamental attack. And more than ever, we have to make sure that as educators, we are sort of the, the torchbearers, if you will, of making sure that we, we stay true to some fundamental principles. And, and history always provides us opportunities to explore not only how we got to where we are, but to give us a window into the future. And so these, these, this project and document collections like ours, they're the, they're the true ways that history continues to echo. You know, every time we pick up a document or uh, an artifact of some kind from the past, anybody has the opportunity to explore that and interpret it and make some, some really engaging uh, assumptions about the past and therefore the present. And so you're absolutely right. These don't, and it is, in, it is insider information. These are not the kinds of works that we uh, are often provided sort of the, the professional acclaim for. Uh, but we also know we need them. These are very valuable for the classroom. These are also, the, these are the, the tools of the trade. If we don't have these materials, we don't get to make those arguments and those longer monographs or those riveting essays. If academics have ever written anything riveting, your, your book is really riveting though, because it's, it's got all types of good stuff in there. It's like history for cable television, you know? And uh, the, the, the opportunities, as they come to, to, to share and explore these kinds of documents and materials with fellow educators and then also students broadly defined is, is, is I just didn't want to miss out on the opportunity because I knew it was important to, to, to make sure that we are continually providing that kind of evidence to these conversations. Yeah, and I can say I've used other um, books in the this, in this series um, to teach and they work so well in the classroom that that sort of setting up the debate and then having the sources, the, what we call the primary sources, those first-hand sources, um, the evidence so that students can get in um, and think about the questions. I think, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to use this. And I would also say anyone who is... Anyone who teaches at a high school or a university, the press is pretty generous with giving out what like review copies. If you say, Absolutely. oh, I might assign it in my class, 
Um, there are ways to get um, to, to tell Oxford University Press that you're an educator and they, they tend to be quite willing to send, um, to send free copies for examination. Yeah, you know, let's talk a little bit more too about the process of these books. And then we'll get into some more of the depth of our, our, our works because you brought up something, Allison, that's really important. These take a lot longer than folks would ever imagine. The idea of editing materials, translating materials, there's an there's a extremely high level of uh, professional responsibility that comes with that and uh, integrity. And then also um, making sure that we're responsive and compassionate to the issues and to the historical actors that are that are a part of the dramas that we're, we're highlighting that there's a there's a whole set of thoughts and practices and then also uh, ideas and assumptions that go into this uh, into the the development of these edited works and uh, if you don't mind, share a little bit about your your process. Talk about how you and your your collaborator kind of went through your process with a little more detail for us. Yeah, um, it really was an iterative process. So it wasn't at first. I guess I, this is why I thought it would be easy. I thought, oh, Victoria will provide me with some translations, then I will do some footnotes and write up some introductions. But translation is, is, is really an interesting field in itself. They've put a lot of thought into, into how translators and translation theorists have put a lot of thought into word choice um, and the impression you're giving and do you want to keep a sense of the flavour of the original language or do you want to make it seem like this document was originally written in English. So there's all sorts of choices there. And my knowledge of the history and the background influenced choices that Victoria made. And then her, we would argue sometimes over word choice, her kind of word choices had to affect my historical interpretation. So yeah, um, it was really meaningful, but yeah, as you said, kind of, it's it's an intense process. Yeah. And now I need to, yeah, I need to throw it back to you because, yeah, you obviously, um, yeah, that 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 sense of integrity being true to the individuals um, involved, you've obviously been thinking about this. Yeah, you know, this this project began probably in 2016. Um, it was it's been several years and. Part of what was really challenging is that um, I, I initially wasn't really focused on one particular era or uh, we, we, were, we were having trouble nailing down the question for this because it was clear that it was going to be too big of a question to try to wrap up in a, a book of that size. It just otherwise it was going to have to be a longer monograph. Right. Uh, and so the, the the process of sort of winnowing the question down uh, took a lot of time. And it, and it because it was challenging about the, the way that this particular um, contribution to the series emerged was, you know, I was covering a lot of historical time frame, and I had to really sort of subsume historiographies that are sometimes in debate with one another or ideas that are in debate with one another or even in some moving in some parallel kind of ways with one another, I had to kind of figure out how to write that in a in a way that provided students with appropriate background, so that we can all get kind of to the same page, so, somewhere to the same place where we we then can engage the debate. And then the the cool thing about this process is I had to write the the opposing arguments of yes, there there was a breakthrough, and no, there was not. And, you know, if you want to really test your own sense of awareness on the subject, write the opposing arguments. And, you know, that was that was in some ways its own exercise in uh, making sure that as an academic, I'm staying true to what the materials tell us, you know, uh, because I and then and of course, there's multiple review. The, the other thing, folks, that we didn't mention, we should. There's multiple review processes along the way, even with these books. This is not, you don't just drop this on a press and, it's, and they say, okay, we're going to print it. You know, each of the essays I wrote had to go through their own internal reviews and external reviews. 
Uh, the documents had to be reviewed uh, for accuracy, but then also to make sure it fit with the themes of the book. And then the, the, the last thing that I really have to say that um, I really am glad and thankful to the Turners and for you for, for getting us into this conversation. I really relied on a lot of the folks that we, we call community partners and friends and colleagues. First of all, Ben Lindsay, Will Checkeritis, Teddy Williams, the graduate students who were working closely with me at the time, they were very much involved in, in how we came to some understanding of the debate and then also some sense of what sources would make sense in the debate. And you know, Ben did a great job with just thinking through some of those earlier sources. We had to cut a lot of them, you know, uh, Will as well. Molly Collins over at the ACLU of Wisconsin, formerly of ACU, ACLU of Wisconsin, really gave me insight into materials around activism and, and arguments around the shaping and the logistics of protest that I had never thought about, just the, the timing around stuff, which is so important for pulling off something massive like the March on Washington. Um, Walt Lanier, Pastor Walt Lanier was very valuable in, in how we think through um, a whole range of other issues that emerge out of protests and activism. So this was an opportunity for me to really engage a whole community of voices to help me think through how to do this appropriately. And I, because I do take it as a responsibility. I think all of us as academics who are really committed to it uh, take the responsibility very seriously. And then of course, I'm finishing mine in 2020 amid pandemic, millions of folks protesting and the press saying, hey, can you get that out a little sooner? <laughs> so there's all of that too, but uh, we'll come back to some more of that stuff here. Let me let me get you hey, back. Hey, hey, can oh, I interrupt okay, and follow sorry, up I was on trying some to... things? Like I, I just, um, you raise things that I think, oh, we need to drill down into that a little bit. And, and there, are, there are questions that really interest me personally. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is I really like the way that this series um, doesn't sort of set up a, a straw man like the argument. You actually do give kind of the best argument for the, the opposing sides of, of the debate. Um, and, and as you said, and you've, you've sort of referred back to uh, um, the sort of organizing idea is, was there a breakthrough in civil rights in the 1960s? Um, so is it which is sort of tied up into other debates that historians have, a sort of a long civil rights movement or a short civil rights movement. Um, but that's just, yes. it's so key It's so key in these sort of the debates that we're having now, the critical race theory. Um, I, I, we don't need to go all the way down that, that tangent, but <laughs> like whether there was a breakthrough in the, in the 1960s is so important mm. um, to how, how we see civil rights history and civil rights present, right? Like um, current um, engagement and activism. And I thought what was particularly original and powerful was that you're explicitly saying, hey, May 2020, what we are living through, um, and especially in the wake of the, at that point, the latest um, police killings. Right. Um, so Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd, um, it, and so I was wondering if I could push you a little bit more on that. I mean, how does that sort of the 2020 and as the pandemic and everything, um, how does that, how did that shape how you came to that debate of whether there was a breakthrough in the 1960s? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there was a particular sense of placement with 2020 uh, based on where the book was headed. And some of that is obviously strategy. You know, folks are gonna be more interested as a result of 2020, maybe than they would have been in 2014, you know. Um, but, the, but the moment also helped to inform the issues, you know, because part of what I actually, was was doing during during the 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 middle months of 2020 was listening you know i was trying to get a sense of what 
issues, questions, ideas that maybe I was not attending to. You know, vernacular was critical. You know, you, you know, all, all of that plays into um, how the, the arguments get shaped and then also ultimately how you write about them in as, uh, you know, uh, professionally responsible way as possible. You know, understanding that we're all bringing some bias, some opinion to, to the table. Um, but we hadn't even gotten to January. There, as historians, you can see the, the civil strife. You can feel the, how, how fragile democracy really is. You know, it's, 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 it's a very, very fragile idea. Now we throw that word around a lot. We, we use it as if, if we use it to mean all kinds of things as, as we explore in our classes, you know. Um, and then in January, the press called and said, hey, can you give us two more sentences now after this? <laughs> because it, 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 it was so clear in November that we weren't done with whatever 2020 had presented us at, in, at any way whatsoever, whether it was protest moment, whether it was, was the pandemic. And, and so even this product itself is still an evolving thing. You know, the, there will be more and more debates about this moving forward. And so it was, it was a great responsibility to, to, to embrace during 2020. And I thank everybody who I talked to over the course of the, the years that, that really gave me insight about how to think through presenting materials and presenting the arguments. Um, but now your, your, your book is, is also a lot of fun because it is in this particular moment that's not only central to US history, but there are some global developments occurring. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how your book is organized, those various chapters and sections and themes, and then get us into some of those stories that help to drive those, those sections? Right, so the, I told, as I said, the book really covers on those um, six years, seven years um, of 1859 to 1865. But if you want to understand Matilda Francisca Arnica, you have to go back to Germany. Um, she was born in Prussian Westphalia. Um, she was married at 19 to a guy who turned out to drink too much and be violent. Um, so she very quickly tries to extract herself from that marriage and keep custody of her baby. Um, and that she managed it. Um, she managed to actually get a divorce, which, um, according to historians of Germany, was really surprising. It's kind of an artifact of some of the specific local law that she did actually manage to get uh, a divorce. But the process makes her a lifelong feminist um, and sort of it's like, why should women be tied to men who can be violent? <laughs> like, how how is that right? Um, and that leads her into sort of further, further radicalism. And she's involved in the revolutions of 1848, 1849 in Germany, which are really complicated. Um, Marx is kind of doing his thing, but then there's also a more moderate um, kind of a liberal moderate um, core um, that are important. Matilda Annika is more in some ways, some people would say she's more radical than Marx at this particular point. Her, she, her second husband, Fritz Annika, is a, um, a communist, um, and she, she fights for a republic. Um, she, uh, she is an Ordnance Offizierin, um, which is sort of a military aid um, to, to people who had military experience. But she's out there on a horse, wearing trousers, riding around um, with the people who actually, by force, want to establish a German republic. Um, which is interesting, you're talking about kind of violence. Um, one of the things that kind of really gave me pause is Matilda Annika believes in violence. Yeah. And that was sort of a thing, like in many ways I sort of identify with her, but it's just, it's interesting to see someone who thinks that positive change comes through violence. Uh, I think that's an interesting thing to grapple with. Um, Can you share some of her contemporaries? Can you just talk a little bit about her crew? There's a there's a portion in your book where you talk about the folks that that she's connected to some of the names. Can you just drop those for us just to 
show folks who we're talking about? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much this will mean um, things to people. Lot, lots of Civil War generals, Carl Schurz, who went on to become um, Secretary for the Interior, um, so Marx and Engels. Um, yeah, you can't just say that like it's not a big deal. <laughs> well, they were just they were <laughs> hanging out in Cologne, um, like fighting at the barricades. Um, yeah, it's interesting because um, they're kind of, it's sort of, Marx is there, but Marxism isn't quite Marxism yet. It's just this guy, right, right? right. Um, who has these ideas. And there are lots of radicals who have lots of different ideas. Um, August Willich, who's a, um, it's W-I-L-L-I-C-H, sometimes Americans say Willich, mm -hmm. um, was uh, an important um, 48er in Germany and then a Civil War general. Um, Ferdinand LaSalle, who founded the um, SPD, uh, which is still a main um, political party in Germany, a sort of a socialist, a sort of centre-left um, kind of democratic socialist um, party. Um, we haven't even gotten to the U.S. really yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you can imagine lots of footnotes. It's kind of like how many, like how much do we say about this person's career right, when they right. show, happen to show up in um, one of her letters? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, but the, if I can kind of carry on a little bit here, mm -hmm, I would do. say that in some ways I think the heart is this relationship with Mary Booth. And Mary Booth is married to Sherman Booth, which is a name people may know. There's a Booth Street in Milwaukee. Um, Sherman Booth was the white abolitionist, sort of the leading white abolitionist in Milwaukee, um, in Wisconsin, I would say, who helps um, Joshua Glover um, break out of jail. Joshua Glover um, in 1854, was escaping slavery in Missouri, and then he was captured and, and jailed um, with the intention of being sent back to slavery. Um, and Sherman Booth is one of the guys who, who stirs up people to break him out of jail in Milwaukee. But so and Mary Booth's an abolitionist too, um, and Matilda Annika and Mary Booth have this really intense relationship. Um, they pack up three of their kids, they have three youngest kids, and they moved to Zurich together, um, Zurich, Switzerland, and they raise their kids together, um, and they write each other really passionate letters. Um, you are the morning star of my soul. They just like they're really intense, um, and they've created this household without men. Yeah. And so, how we define that relationship when we're not we don't know exactly what happened in bed is sort of one of the central questions of the book. Yeah. Well, it, it was really powerful, not only uh, as the, the stories and the, the, the multiple romances that run through the book are unfolding, but also the global dimensions of it all. Can you kind of talk about the, I mean, we call it transnational, you know, we have all these academic words and all that, but here we have Milwaukee, Germany, you know, there's, there's multiple cities in the U.S. that are referenced in these stories. Can you give us some sense about the this broader global reality that's sort of clear in the in these travels and in these stories? Yeah, I was I guess I was fully struck by how international these the radical networks at the time um, were. And uh, I have a colleague at George Washington University, Andy Zimmerman, and their they're, they're about to publish a new book, which I think will be even more interesting, bringing in some sort of radicalism from the Caribbean um, and, and among enslaved people into that moment of, of the Civil War. Um, I guess maybe one place is to start is to point out that 25% of Union soldiers were born outside the US. And, I mean, they're mostly, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're immigrants sort of like me um, often. Um, so, so European or um, European origin um, immigrants, lots of Irish and German and English um, people. So it's a different sort of diversity, but I think a lot, my students are often surprised when I say that, that, you know, 25% of Union soldiers, and that's not counting their kids, right? So that's right. foreign born people. Um, and I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that um, the U.S. in its sort of fight against these rebel pro-slavery states 
um, the United States is looking for approval from European powers. So a lot of what Matilda and Mary are doing while they're in Zurich is publishing articles um, that are anti-slavery until we get the Emancipation Proclamation, right? It's not clear, um, you know, even once the war started, it's not right. clear. I mean, Lincoln doesn't think it's an anti-slavery war. Um, African-Americans did, right? But, right? but Lincoln takes a while to come around to it. Um, and then, um, sorry, I'm looking at the time here. Um, so that they're writing um, German language and English language, abolitionist and pro-union um, literature and mm -hmm. sort of trying to, to persuade Europeans to support um, the cause of emancipation too. Really great stuff. Really great stuff. It's really enjoyable. And, you know, letters themselves are so fun to read. You know, it's like you, you know, you're sneaking and reading someone's diary almost. You're, you're getting these very personal stories that then you can expound in, into context of a moment or, or context of an era. Really enjoyable. Yeah, I see that we said originally, oh, we'll, we'll go for 40 minutes and then see if people have questions. I don't, I don't know if we want to stick um, religiously to that, Amelia. I have so many more questions. I could talk to Rob. For yeah, and, and ask ask some more questions and then Amelia will cut us off. when the yeah, I've, got, I've got four questions from uh, various users across YouTube we can introduce later just to let you know they're in the hopper. But keep it up. This is fascinating. Okay, so this question, Rob, you sort of set up right at the okay. beginning, which is that some documents maybe are controversial, um, and that's why they haven't been kind of more widely, they aren't more widely known, right? Like it's not all letter from a Birmingham jail or I have a dream. Right. I mean, you're looking at kind of some other documents um, as well. Could you give an example of one of those, a document that you think just, hasn't gotten the attention that it should, um, well, that there, you include? Yeah, there's so many that are a part of our, our sort of scholarly world, but we don't oftentimes explore them. One, I, I, I often use the organizing principles of the Ku Klux Klan uh, because it, it provides a very important window into what happens after 1865, what happens after uh, the Civil War. We don't oftentimes put that into context. We don't oftentimes say, where did all of the Confederate soldiers go? You know, what did they do? They, they, they went back to the South and then what? They went to a world that had been turned upside down. And obviously, as far as they were concerned, the conquest, the, the war itself hadn't necessarily ended. And, and the, the KKK principles kind of help us think through how you take this formally structured, militarized entity and then replicate that and place that paramilitary institution in society that becomes then the violent arm of white supremacy across the South. And then in some cases uh, over the decades across the nation. So that's, that's one that we don't often look at that is, is very instructive. Um, also, there's been a very persistent, but lately, uh, uh, sort of a revving up of interest in, in James Baldwin. And so we included some Baldwin also so that folks can not only get, we get a lot of sound bites from Baldwin now, you know, and especially in our, our, our over sound bite driven world, but, but to sit down and read something from James Baldwin with, with depth um, shows how brilliant of a thinker he remains and how important his critiques of racism are uh, in, in a longstanding sense. I also included some materials from Madam C.J. Walker. I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. Madam C.J. Walker is this remarkable pioneering um, entrepreneur, civil rights activist, philanthropist, uh, either the first woman, certainly the first African-American woman millionaire uh, in the country. She sets up operation in Indianapolis and builds this industrial empire around what we would generally, generally refer to as wellness and self-care these days. Um, she then goes on to train uh, scores upon scores of other women who become their own entrepreneurs in the process of uh, sharing and, 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 and expanding that cosmetics empire. Uh, so as a kid, I grew up under the influence of 
Madam C.J. Walker and the, not only um, her significance, but also the, this really important component of the role that entrepreneurs have played in the longstanding struggle for Black liberation, how important it was for folks to have economic independence to have the, the institutions where meetings could be held, to help finance local struggles, which we don't, we don't think about how expensive it is to run a campaign. Like, you know, you start talking about managing, supporting a longstanding uh, movement of any kind, it costs money. And so I, I really enjoy uh, adding Madam C.J. Walker to the conversation. She's oftentimes lost in that early 20th century moment around black liberation struggles. Um, I saw Star Wars at the Madam C.J. Walker Theater, you know, it's just, <laughs> um, so there's that. Also, I included the, um, one of the first speeches that Angela Davis gives after uh, being acquitted from her charges. And there's just such a powerful hopefulness in the people and the struggle of the people that she brings in those words. And it really gets us back to this fundamental question too about our responsibilities. What do you cut? I had to, I had to go back and forth with the editor about how long that particular uh, contribution to the uh, collection would be because what, what words do you cut from Angela Davis? You know, um, and it's just, so those are some of the, the, the favorite uh, entries for me and the ones that I think are, are just a few of the snippets of useful ones, but there, there are plenty of them. There are plenty of them, and they're, and they're all really good because I got other people's opinions in the process, and I just want to always shout that out, you know. Can I um, just sort of related to that? When I, when I teach um, African-American history in my classes, sometimes the, I find there's a challenge of balancing describing the injustice versus giving voice to the people who are fighting it. Sure. Did you, did you find, um, and I guess maybe what can you tell teachers who, who, who face that and how did you think about that? Um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a, I think it's a professional challenge that never goes away and, and, and looks differently in other ways and in other uh, areas of interest. Uh, one thing that I, I really challenge myself and and it's important to do that because then it keeps the classroom fresher and, and I'm not always delivering the same stuff. I challenge myself to not only tell a story about uh, the black experience that is one uh, specifically or only formed around oppression. You know, that that is it's easy to slip into this notion that the only experience, uh, the only uh, significant Black experience is this fight against oppression. And it's powerful. It's, it's important. It's central. It's one of the central threads. It is, it is defining in so many ways, but it's not the only story. You know, this is where making sure we are responsible to words and ideas like dignity and, and, and making sure that we're offering dignified examples and offering conversations that get us into what it means to live a dignified existence. How did folks live with dignity under the hostility of slavery or Jim Crow? Indeed they did. And we, we are charged as historians, no matter how hard and difficult it is to find that out, we were responsible for helping to add those threads into the narratives about race and racism. Uh, in some cases, in, in many cases, some of these narratives have been, have been crafted without the voices of the people central in that process. And you know, over the last several decades or so, in some cases since the civil rights era, but maybe earlier too, there's been just a wider and more welcoming uh, understanding of the importance of voices from on the margins and on the peripheries. And of course we see the pushback, right? The, we can talk about the critical race theory stuff. But yeah, of, of course institutions that, uh, and people who are used to longstanding power would be threatened by ideas, right? Ideas are threatening. Ideas are the thing that, that, that the, the oppressive forces want to crush more than anything else because ideas germinate. We saw ideas germinate in 2020. We know that there are teachers, my comrades, who want to teach this stuff and want to do a great job of teaching it in some very hostile environments. And we have a responsibility to, 
you know, answer that call to intellectual arms, especially in this movement, in this moment where uh, intellectualism is so under attack. And I know you've been part of um, writing a statement against the Wisconsin kind of bill that would make it difficult for high school teachers, for K-12 right. teachers to talk about race, to talk Absolutely. about racism. It's, a, it's absurd to think we have to still even have these conversations, but, the, you know, was there a I, breakthrough in the 1960s, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've had students in my class who suggest that talking about racism is itself racist um, and so sort of very difficult and it's very difficult I mean so it but I realize like I have I've have, I have so much protection for me it's it's uh, it's a it's it's an annoyance sometimes mm -hmm. I lose some sleep I have to put a lot of work into managing the situation and most I guess most of all I'm concerned about other students in the class who are who are subjected to this, but then with um, yeah, with this sort of legal um, and um, astroturf campaign to to make it life difficult for teachers, it's very it's, it's going to be hard. And we have to be careful. I'm going to always say this to folks who are uh, you know having to deal with this, folks. Just make sure that you don't end up sounding crazy talking to a crazy person. You know, because the, these debates that are being waged and in, in the way that they're being waged, uh, the, 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 it, it, they can have you responding to some, some pretty ridiculous stuff. And that's what's the, 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 the quote, the minutia is the refuge of the scoundrel. Well, the, you know, it, there, there's all types of absurdity that is turning into refuges for, for scoundrel approaches to the undermining of accuracy and fact and, and true history. And, and, you know, our teachers need far more support than they need critiques. And don't get me wrong, I'm a parent. So I, I, I got plenty of critiques. I, you know, that's what we do, right? That's what, our, our primary job is to critique stuff. But at the same time, our, our educators need some grace, especially when they're, they're, they're grappling with some tough topics. We probably we should Eddie? go to the questions. Um, Emilio, that's um, great. We have we have a bunch of questions coming in uh, in a variety of ways, and, and I'd like to share a few. I'm going to start with a question for Rob because it's uh, it's a little connected to what you were discussing. When um, so they ask that, what's it like to write about history, knowing that the struggle for justice is still occurring? Did you get the feeling that it's not so much history you're writing, but current events? Uh, and what did that feel like? Yeah, you know, as historians, we're, we're kind of snobby that way. We like to sit back and let things unfold and then offer analyses as they're unfolding, especially these days, there's so much static on the frequency. You know what I mean? There's just so much noise. And if you're not careful, the noise can draw you into some stuff that you really don't want to be drawn into as you're trying to, to really write about um, the past and whether we, I think any, everybody should recognize that the present shapes the, the past and vice versa and all of that. You know, we think about the past differently based on what we learn today and what based on what we'll learn in the future about the past. Uh, and so it, it is, uh, as I mentioned, an awesome responsibility. But the, when, when, the, when the future provides the kind of echoing that we've seen throughout Black liberation struggles, throughout the Black experience, in a, in a number of our other rights-based arenas, when we hear those echoes, uh, it's really a, a, a confirmation that injustices are still with us. We, we know how the, the era of colorblindness has sought to sort of uh, provide this veneer that we have to continually poke at and uncover and reveal the realities of that. Uh, so, so the the present um, does impact the past, but when but when the when the past echoes in the way that it has over the over the last several years, um, you then are forced, and you you then have to um, embrace your scholarly responsibility to listen to those echoes too. You know, when when things become so pronounced, the the present is also very instructive about the past in that, at that moment. Thank you for that. And, uh, and for those 
uh, following at home, we're experiencing uh, technical difficulties here at Turner Hall. Spectrum's been working in the street for a while, so we keep getting shut off. I've shared the questions in the chat with our panelists in case uh, I get disconnected again. Uh, a couple of questions for you, Allison. Uh, so somebody wanted to know what Matilda Anarchy's relationship to Milwaukee was. And another question uh, also that I found quite fascinating is uh, you know, she was living at a time when women couldn't boat or order beer in public or wear bikinis. Just how dangerous was it for Matilda Annika to live and think as she did? Can you put that in context for us? Both of those could be like really, um, you know, I could spend an hour talking about each one. Um, Matilda Annika, I would say, had mixed feelings about Milwaukee. Um, she had, her mother lived, moved to Milwaukee with them as well as sort of um, siblings of her and siblings of Fritz. Um, and J Milwaukee was so German at, at the time when she moved in 1850. About a third of the population had been born in Germany and then had their kids, right? Um, so she could get away with not learning um, English. Um, and so she lived in um, Milwaukee for most of the time between 1850 and 1884 when she died. And I think she thought of it as a children's home. That's one of the reasons she came back after being in Zurich and also Mary died. Um, so <laughs> I don't want to spoil the ending for you. Someone dies at the end of the book. Um, but um, Mat Matilda Annika became a sort of institution in Milwaukee. She opened a, after the Civil War, after my book, she came back um, and opens a girls' school, a private girls' school where kind of some names you would recognize, the Fister family, um, sort of big name German Americans in town would send their daughters to this expensive private school. And she was um, active in the women's suffrage movement at that point. Um, and she had other relationships with women um, too. And it's interesting to get some jealousy. There's some jealousy that comes up in the book um, from another woman who's interested in Matilda Annika in Zurich, but feels like Matilda Annika is so attached to, um, to Mary um, as, as she was. And then, so the question is how- Can I say something? Sorry. Can you kind of talk a little bit about this particular point, like folks, it's in the letters like these. These Can you explain kind of that the the complexity and the, the jealousy and all that? Like they're actually writing about it in the letters. I think maybe that's why it's so hard to talk about, because it is so I mean, you're seeing I sort of imagine someone trying to analyze my texts or something and try to work out. So are they really lesbians or, you know, it's but it's complicated, these relationships. But you see like really intense, yeah, expressions of emotion. Um, and you see jealousy um, and you see that they're sharing a bed at one point and you see, you know, that they're, um, Matilda's staying up to nurse uh, Mary Booth in the night and that the children are calling both women mama, all of the children. Um, but, and... And I think that lesbians should claim Matilda and Mary. I, I think it's a queer relationship, but in some ways it's pre-lesbian. They didn't identify as lesbian because it, it hadn't really solidified as a category. Like those, those, um, those categories of gay and lesbian really solidify more around 1900. And... There was, in the, it's, it's interesting because this is what we think of as Victorian culture where the nuclear family is kind of idealized, but there's also an acceptance that women had these very intense friendships. So I, this is a, it was a surprise to me that there's relatively little disapproval um, of the relationship, um, which, I don't know. Even if you think they're just friends, the fact that they can live without men, these kind of men who are, you know, off kind of doing, you know, I don't want to sort of badmouth them too much, but these sort of these losers, their husbands do not come out well out of this out of this book. Um, can I read an a, a excerpt? Oh, please. OK, this is from uh, one of the earlier chapters, probably chapter one. Old ties tested, new bonds formed. It's in one of the letters 
from Matilda to Fritz. And this is, uh, they're splitting up. Matilda and Fritz are splitting up. Matilda writes, dear Fritz, we should never have married. We should have stayed friends and we may have both led happier lives. And indeed we love each other more like friends now. We love each other since we are most intimately related through the children we have together. But we do not love each other like lovers who both feel that their desire for each other feels their existence and can only be satisfied by the touch of pure lips when they kiss. This yeah. she said that to the guy she's breaking up with. <laughs> yeah. I'll she take believes that break in up. intense. She believes in expressing herself and in these intense emotions. Yeah. Um, so I feel like some people might be wanting to get off around um, one. I don't know. Can I share? Like, I have a discount code. If you do want to order the book through the press website, they gave me a code um, so you can get 40% off and free shipping in the US. I don't know. Can we put that in the chat? It just, I see the chat. Does, can we do it so that um, everybody? Yes, it's uh, it's placed in the chat in two seconds, and it will be shared in uh, Facebook and archive so that people can take advantage of this discount. Thank you. And it, yeah, it's good till the twenty fifth, so the press doesn't want it to be forty <laughs> percent discount for all time. But um, September twenty fifth, um, if you're interested in in buying your own copy. And I don't have a discount code, but as Allison mentioned before, university presses will send you an exam copy if you're an educator, especially. And we're sharing uh, that link again here, as well as all of those who are invited into the Zoom uh, webinar and clicked to get here, the links to purchase both books were included in that invitation. However, Allison has just shared a 40% off coupon, which is valid until September 25th. Uh, panelists, this is, uh, you know, Rob and Allison, this is great. I think that we could go on for a long time. This is really exciting. Uh, there are, are a lot of uh, questions unanswered that we'll share here in the chat, uh, and, and you can take a look at it. And there are more questions coming in. The, the tricky part about this is we're getting questions in Zoom, questions in Facebook. I had somebody email me a question, like, why are you emailing me? You see me talking to you. Um, and I just want to thank you both. This is fascinating. And I love this, uh, this conversation of arts and culture. The fact that, uh, that, that both of you uh, adopted children of Milwaukee, like myself, uh, have contributed these great books that are here to share. And I think that uh, this juxtaposition of what we're wrestling with now as Americans and as Milwaukeeans is reflected in, in both of your books, which on the surface seem so different. But at the core level of it, I believe that we are um, still wrestling very critically with these issues today. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you, Emilio. Thanks, folks. Uh, this was great. I want to share a couple of things before we uh, say goodbye uh, to everyone. Join us here again in the future. Uh, all of you will be emailed invites to our uh, next presentations. Our upcoming uh, episodes will be focusing on recent elections and voting uh, how Wisconsin audits itself and has clean and clear elections, and as well as a couple of other episodes on uh, displacement and gentrification. We'll be meeting with very talented panelists from all across Milwaukee. I want to also invite you to a few events coming up uh, this week. So on uh, October 16th, the Hone Bridge will be lit red in honor and celebration of Mildred Fish Harnack, a Milwaukeean who helped lead the resistance to the Nazi regime. She went uh, to Milwaukee High School of the Arts, to UW-Madison, and was indeed um, the only uh, American condemned to death by Adolf Hitler. She was guillotined uh, by the Gestapo in Berlin, Germany somewhere. Uh, on September 9th, we'll be having a connection with Lighting of the Home, the Milwaukee Turners, as well as our friends from DSA and Cooperation Milwaukee and other groups. We'll host a little uh, outdoor uh, celebration, a little barbecue in the parking lot celebrating her life. That's September 19th from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, here in the Northern parking lot of Turner Hall. Uh, and then on September 23rd, there will be a book discussion uh, hosted by Boswell Books in connection with a lot of other groups. Uh, and the, it is a biography of Mildred Fish Harnack, uh, September 23rd at 5 p.m. I'll put the link in the chat. And this book was written by her great-great, her great-grandniece, Rebecca Donner. 
Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you again sometime in the near future. Uh, and until then, please take care of one another. Thank you also to our uh, sponsors that we mentioned earlier, but again, uh, Marquette University's Curdo, uh, Michael Milwaukee's Inner Cities Congregation, Allied for Hope, Milwaukee Jewish Community Relations Council, the National Lawyers Guild of Milwaukee, Rid Racism Milwaukee, Toasted Together, and Wisconsin Voices. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these conversations three or four times a month. Have a great time, friends. <laughs>